so many Barbies. I don't understand how this guy's got toys all over his office. It's weird. He's got like like one of those weeboos or something. One of them guys with the toys all over the place. I don't, I don't get it. He's dumb and I just... Oh, there we go. Look at the guy's live on the YouTube. I ran out of time to do anything video related in my garden this week. So I'll do a stream like putting a bandage on an artery. It doesn't really stop things like it should. The bleeding will continue. The bleeding will continue. Cause I've been so busy. Running around in circles. An unexpected tizzy. Tizzy. It's so good to see all of you So good to see all of you On this brand new good stream Hey everybody! Good evening! I know it is late, especially for those of you on Eastern Time. <clears throat> some of you guys, it's probably early morning in some place in the world where the... I don't know, I saw this diagram and like the Earth is this big pancake or something and the sun just goes around and circles over it weirdest thing i ever saw never knew that but it's like you find these things out on the internet and you go huh oh no, i never thought about that i thought that i don't know i thought that there was like a a house that the sun came out of and just kind of went over and then like you went into a tunnel or something and then went through but no it's like a it's like a big spotlight or something crazy and and i just love science Absolutely love science. That sort of thing just gets my mind going. So how you guys doing? Good morning, Indonesia. Adam. Man, I, I love Indonesia. I had a whirlwind agricultural visit to Indonesia right before the pandemic and everything fell apart worldwide. And, uh, wow. Uh, wonderful people. Wonderful culture. It's so much, so many different cultures and tribes inside of one country. It was, it was incredible going from place to place. We were in an area that was all majority Christian, and then we were in an area that was majority Muslim, and then we were in an area that was majority Hindu. Hospitality was great wherever we were, but the customs and the art and the dress and even the way people looked, different. A lot of different people there. It was fascinating, so... That's what I wanted to say about Indonesia. Thank you all for joining in. So, hey, uh, Austin. Hedgehog's Homestead. Senko. Benjamin. j Mao. <laughs> j Mao says, my swamp water is completely black on week two. Yay. Oh, yeah. That means it's soaked in a lot of the good stuff. Hey, Alan. Good to see you. Scott. Scope Scar Outdoors. Roy Rogers. Good to see you. I know. You sent me an email. I haven't gotten back to you. A little crazy. Sonia and Zachary. <laughs> Dead chicken in the swamp water. <laughs> hey, Jens. In Illinois. Hey, Chris. And Adam. And Kathy. And Kim Tippin Wood Turning. Awesome. Enjoy being Pinion Puppy. Disaster Survivor's Guide. That is always useful. Fishes and Loaves Life. Good to see you. Good to see you, Don. Good to see you, Jennifer. Kara and Kim and Homestead Medic and Creeper King and Shady Man and man, there's a lot of people here. And Johnny Cash. And Johnny Cash. Woo! <clears throat> so one of these days I'm gonna do wood turning, Kim. I love it. I have this bowl in the house. It's an old wood turned bowl. I think it's made out of maple. Very, very hard wood and, and beautiful. I, I love that. Looks like a lot of fun, except I'm afraid of like doing it and shooting a chisel through my eye. So how many of you guys saw... Let's get into a conspiracy right here. 
How many of you guys witnessed the demolition of the Georgia Guidestones earlier today? I believe it was yesterday. I feel like everything's running together. The New World Order is in fast forward, let me tell you that. How many guys uh, see the Georgia Guidestones got destroyed? How many of you are aware that there is a compound called Swamp Water which was being brewed near it? The noxious fumes, so powerful, they destroyed a monument that had stood since 1980. Incredible. <laughs> it was swamp water. I have a theory. Yeah, it was lightning. I know. Uh, John says I was down the road. Woo! Crazy. We haven't got to the subject yet, Don. This is the opening. That's the way it works. We just had to talk about swamp water. And the, and the Georgia Guidestones. Pretty crazy. Crazy to see that there's just so many weird things going on in the world today. Don't, I mean, don't you guys just sometimes wonder what in the world is going to happen next? And to who? And where? What in the world is going on? It just feels like everybody's messing with us now. Constantly messing with us. I have um, I've almost tuned the news out. But I couldn't miss that one. Crazy, crazy times. So anyhow, um, I thought, well, I have been super, super busy. We are in the midst of a bunch of hard work at the moment, and uh, hopefully I'll have some news for you soon. But uh, some unexpected family stuff to deal with, and um, just haven't been making it out to the garden. And uh, so I thought, you know what, let's just do a stream and we can reconnect. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about swamp water in particular, which I want to tell you about because I got a really nice email today, which I found very encouraging. And I have to say, there is a, um... <clears throat> oh, let me see here. I'm going to see if I can find it. Where is it? Hopefully I can actually find it because it was a really cool... It's a really cool email. Let me see. Oh man, what is going on? lose everything. I get so many emails. This is really a problem. <laughs> Terrible. Um, oh, brother. I, uh, yeah, you should really prep for this sort of thing, you know. Anyhow, I got a very nice email uh, that I thought was, um, let me see if I can. I'm gonna do a search and see if I can find it. <clears throat> no, I'm not finding it. So <laughs> I hope I didn't accidentally delete it. Okay, let's see. Nope, nope. I would like to watch David the Good. Um, I would like to watch David the Good look through his sent emails and try and figure out when in the world he responded. <laughs> okay, anyhow, I'll just, I'll just, I will summarize. Let's say we're going to start over. We're going to start over right now. I went to see David. I'm going to sing Scott Head's version of it. David the Good would listen to Portis Head and drank spiced rum. Okay. I got I got to get a little so more southern twang if I'm going to live in the south. Anyhow, actual content starts here. Swamp water. Let's talk about swamp water because this is dangerous. I find it to be somewhat terrifying to 
know that when I put a video out, a bunch of people are going to do it or try it or criticize it or tell me why it's wrong. I don't worry so much about the criticizing and tell me what it's what is wrong. In it just in general, it, because I, a lot of times I've worked with a lot of the stuff I talk about I've worked about and I've done before. So we'll just shelve that. We'll circle back to that. The the thing that kind of is scary is when you say, you know what, this worked really well for me. I really love this method. There was a time that I recommended something that I thought was amazing and defended it to the hilt. And then I found out something that worked way, way better. And I looked back and I was like, oh, previous me didn't know as much as previous me thought he knew. Previous me was pretty strongly opinionated. However, with the swamp water, I, I'm telling people, you know what? You can make a terrifying anaerobic solution that could possibly kill you and use it to feed your plants. It works really well. It's a dangerous gift. It works very well. But you could do something stupid. You could, um, you could get sick. Um, you could kill your plants. You could definitely kill your plants with swamp water. Because when I explain something, it's not like I'm making it necessarily right there with you. I try to give you the best bit of information that I have possible. I've done this and this and this, and then I thin it out and I test it and I see how it works. And I see if this is going to be too much or too little or whatever. And there's always something that I overlook when I do a video. So which is why I did a follow-up video on swamp water. You know, how do you do this? What did you do with this? Did you dilute it? Did you do this? Did you do this? Could you add this? Could you not add this? Should you add this? When should you use it? Uh, what happens if it does this? What happens if it does this? What happens if it does this? You know, there's all kinds of, of, of what ifs. And I, I'm kind of get the idea why when you get a product, like if you get a baby crib, it's got about 30 warnings on it. And it's stuff like if you take the bars out of this baby crib and, um, and you jump down the stairs while you have this bar in your mouth, it could go through your entire body and you could bleed to death. Just keep that in mind. Uh, it's also a choking hazard, a suffocation hazard. Uh, it has compounds that are known to cause cancer in California. If you place it near a large stone monument, it may explode. You know, I mean, there's all these warnings and you look at it and go, that's so dumb. Really? Like, literally, somebody would stick this part in their mouth and choke to death on it? Why would they do that? That's so dumb. But so, anyway, it's a little scary sometimes. You get two, you know, when you get three or four hundred thousand views on a video, and you know that a decent amount of people are going to try it, somebody might kill their kale. Somebody might lodge head and drown, like it says on the five gallon buckets. I don't know. <clears throat> So there's always this kind of yes, you know, funny stuff. Hey, everybody's so afraid of everything. I agree, and I and I like to I like to say you know here is the here are some tools for you. Here's something that worked for me. I mean, people have told me you shouldn't have done chainsawing without having Kevlar pants on. Yeah, you're probably right. <clears throat> I looked it up. I saw how Kevlar pants work, so I went out and I bought some Kevlar pants. Now I have chainsaw pants, my special chainsaw pants. One of my sons calls my, I have, I have some boxers. All right. So I do, I wear boxers. Occasionally I go through the house in a pair of boxers and get myself a cup of coffee, sometimes shirtless, which I don't put on YouTube because there are a lot of happy married people out there. And I don't want to cause anybody to stumble or to be jealous or envious or any of these sorts of things. It's very important to protect people. But anyhow, I may be walking through the house in my boxers with a cup of coffee occasionally, especially when it's 95 degrees outside. One of the kids calls them, those are dad's special pants. I like your special pants, dad. 
Why is everybody- Why are you all jokers? I don't- How did this happen to me? Why can't you kids be normal? You got your special pants, Dad? <laughs> special pants! Okay, okay, thanks. I appreciate it. But now I have chainsaw pants. Yeah, I have chainsaw pants. Special chainsaw pants. No, I don't have any special chainsaw pants. <laughs> chainsaw Kevlar boxers. It's amazing. Okay, so anyhow, that's enough about that. But I just wanted to say there's always um there's always a little bit of danger in it. And and I had somebody write me and say, I poured swamp water onto my potted tomatoes and I thinned it out. And it killed my two tomatoes. They died overnight. I was like, they died? Like, they just wilted and died. It, like, it torched them. I'm like, uh, what did you put in it? And kerosene? No, it was just, like, a bunch of weeds and some stuff. And and it, it killed, killed the tomatoes. I'm really sorry. Don't sue me. I buried huevos rancheros in my garden, and this happened. That's nice. That's hilarious. That's the question. How much was it thinned, right? So she thinned it down some. She told me, yeah, I said, it's probably too strong. It's too much alcohol in it, possibly. Um, cause there, and there's, you know, there's other compounds in it sometimes. Sometimes there's too much nitrogen. Could have too much salt in it from something. Don't really know, but I said, I said, so it just killed your plants. Yeah, it killed my plants. Wow, I'm really sorry. Um, but she says, funny thing, though, is that the chard I put it on is doing good. Chard's doing okay. Well, generally, my experience has been that it works really well. You have tomato sauce on my hands. <laughs> Kathy says, so much pressure. You know. <clears throat> so anyhow, it's pretty funny. <laughs> you can saw through the Satan stones with your pants. <laughs> Great for King. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Defeating the New World Order with my special pants. Oh my goodness. That's hilarious. <laughs> Scott says, silly lady, you have to taste your DFSW first. Anyhow, I apologize. I said, you know, I'd probably just thin it more. I'm not exactly sure what happened. But then today I got this email that I really, really want to read to you and I can't find it. And I don't know why I can't find it. But... It was a very, very nice email that I just don't seem to have for some reason. I must have, like, I don't know, accidentally deleted it or something. I don't know what I did with it. I, I don't see it. Yeah, it's just not here. Let's see. Maybe, maybe I accidentally put it in the trash. I'm going to check the spam. Maybe I accidentally put it in the spam. No. No, oh, there's a bunch of spam. All the stuff the IRS is sending me. So I um I got this really nice email uh from a from some folks that also live in Alabama and they said that they really, really thanked me for the swamp water. They had started watching me some time ago and they had seen that I make the swamp water, and they said they had the most record corn that they have ever had. That it was like magic and it just opened up this we don't need to make a bunch of compost. We don't need to haul in manure. We could feed all this corn. And that their corn was over 12 feet tall. And they had the largest ears that they've ever had. And thank you very much. And they greatly appreciated me sharing it. So the problem sometimes is that you kind of have to adapt to your own environment. And you have to use some common sense. And you have to experiment. And really... Like I've said many times, I killed a lot of plants becoming a good gardener. Will this grow here? Let me see. No. Will this grow here? Let me see. No. Will this grow here? Oh, it grew great there. So you got to figure these things out. One time I planted... Um, let me think. How many did I plant? I planted... Three, yeah, three. It was three Japanese persimmons into my food forest in North Florida. I love Japanese persimmons. I had two Fuyu persimmons and a Hachia, if I remember correctly. The Hachia and one of the Fuyu persimmons were near the driveway at the wide open, sunniest part of the food forest system. <clears throat> Another Fuyu 
It was placed at the edge of an oak canopy. There was a large water oak in the front yard. I figured I'd just leave it. <coughs> and I said, well, I know persimmons like full sun, but I don't know if full sun means full sun, like really full sun, because Florida full sun is not the same as full sun in Tennessee or full sun in Illinois. We have Illinois here this evening. Or full sun in Indonesia. We don't know how much full sun is full sun. But Florida full sun is brutal. So I planted one of those three persimmon trees at the edge of the oak canopy. <clears throat> it's one of the problems with the food forest system is that canopy can sometimes overwhelm it. It can become a problem. And the idea that you could have a big tree with a bunch of smaller trees and a bunch of shrubs under those, you're starting to stack shade in the food system. And that can really become a problem. <coughs> Pardon me. And so I discovered after a few years that the persimmon that was in the shade would indeed grow, but it would not bloom or fruit. It would not set a single fruit for me. Huh. So, was that a waste of a tree? <clears throat> Maybe. But I don't think so. <coughs> because I've moved to three or four different three different homesteads since then. And I won't plant a <laughs> That's probably you're probably right, Mary. Thank you. Please don't mention it though. I'd I'd like to live um I learned by losing that one tree, maybe a $30 persimmon tree. I didn't lose it. I guess I could have transplanted it at some point. But I learned that they don't like to be even in half sun. <clears throat> Whereas I learned at the same time, I did another experiment. Two orange trees. One of them planted underneath the edge of the oak canopy. The other one wide open. We got a night where it touched freezing. The one that was wide open cracked. The bark cracked. The top froze. And it died back to the root stalk. The one that was underneath the oak canopy lived and fruited. I lost an orange tree. But I learned the oranges are supposed to like full sun. I know they love full sun. But... The frost protection of having a oak canopy over the top of it made the one in the shade live, and it didn't mind the shade so much that it wouldn't fruit. <clears throat> Might have got sweeter oranges or something if it was in full sun. They seem, they seem like they're fine to me, but... You know, you learn these things. So when I, you know, sometimes when I do a video and I say, here's swamp water. Check this out. This is really cool. I'm experimenting with it. Can you test it in a lab and know exactly what's in it? Yeah, you could test this particular batch in a lab and know exactly what's in it. But I know that I put in some clover, and I think I put in some rabbit manure, and I put in some eggshells in case it gets a little acidic and it dissolves some of that calcium in there. That would be cool. And I chopped down some wild grass, and I chopped down some golden rods, and I threw some weeds in it, and I probably threw a few rotten fruit in there. Okay, so if I test this stuff, <clears throat> do I test it at two weeks when I start using it? Do I test it again at a month? Do I test it at six months? I could do all these things. But during the course of the year, the ingredients are going to change. The concentrations are going to change. If I do an another batch, it's not going to be the same. This batch might be higher in potassium for some reason. I might have got one particular weed that was in the potassium accumulation phase of its growth. Something might have been higher in nitrogen because it was earlier in the year. It's spring when I made the batch, and by the time I'm using it, it's summer. Maybe the next batch I make, I make in the fall, and it has a lot more carbon in it. And it's a different set of minerals that are in there. So, man, there are so many variables. <clears throat> So well, the way I try to look at it is, 
Every day in your garden is a set of experiments and you're going to kind of feel over time which ones work better and which ones work worse. You may find that a batch of swamp water is too strong. You threw a whole bunch of stuff in there, you let it rot for three, four weeks. Turns out, you know, when you pour on your tomatoes, they die. So next time you thin it out to half of that amount or a quarter of that amount or less and you see, how does it work? It gets pretty obvious if you've burned stuff. <clears throat> and it gets pretty obvious if you didn't feed them enough. Sometimes you don't feed them enough. And you pour your swamp water in there and it doesn't look like it did anything. When I made a strong batch of swamp water uh, some years ago to feed my corn, I had some extra fish emulsion too. Like I had bought some fish emulsion and I poured that in there and I put in a few scoops of uh, chicken manure. I can't remember what else I put in it. I just, oh, I think I put some Epsom salts in it. I, try, I tried to say, okay, how many different things could I put in here that might have micronutrients that the plants could use? And then I just made this horrible stinking batch of it, 55-gallon drum of stinking water, and every couple of weeks I poured it right down the rows on the corn, on the young leaves, on the ground, and they greened up and they grew like crazy. Corn is a pig as plants go. Some things you put nitrogen on them and they burn fast and it's over. That's it for that. Other things you could directly side dress with chicken manure and you won't hurt them. I side dressed uh, sugar cane with chicken manure and it did fine. I side dressed a tight little bed of kale and all the edges burned. I just dusted it with chicken manure. Too much. <clears throat> Too much. So you kind of you kind of look at it and go, okay, um, this one felt about right, and this one worked pretty well. But you're not going to really necessarily get exact exact measurements. You're kind of eyeing it up and feeling it out. And so what I recommend you do is you start with something like that, more diluted, and work towards stronger concentrations. But over time, you get to know your plants too. You know that if there's an herb that really doesn't need much nitrogen at all, and you happen to splash this stuff all over it, you may just torch it and it might die. Meanwhile, the banana tree that's next to it might grow a foot the next week. Whew! Interesting. Hey, have a good night in Ireland, Bobby. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Dust Rabbit says, if you start very diluted, then how often to feed garden the DFSW? So one thing you can do is every time, every time that you water, you could use a very dilute solution of fitted swamp water. This is called fertigating, when you have a little bit of fertilizer in your irrigation. What you're, what, what happens is, is the plants often absorb what flows past the root zone, which is why my dad used to throw his his weed and feed. I know, don't just, just don't, don't, just don't, don't get into that. He would throw weed and feed out on the lawn before the rain, so it would the rain would put the fertilizer through because he, he realized or somebody had told him if you put your fertilizer down before it rains, the rain brings it past the root zone. But a bunch of dry fertilizer it just sits on the ground. It doesn't get water. It doesn't go past the root zone. It takes a very long time to start greening the lawn up. But you get one rain and it goes right through and everything starts greening up. The A dilute fertilizer solution running past the roots of your plants is an incredible way to make them grow fast and be happy. <clears throat> you could use it every time you watered if it was thinned out enough. The problem comes is if you're over, over fertilizing the plant. If the plants are getting really lush and green and starting to grow fast, sometimes that will set off signals to pests and diseases that there's a little too much nitrogen in this system. These things are doing a little too... They're getting a little too crazy and it's overstimulated on growth and they'll come and prune it all back for you or kill it. Some plants don't seem to get too much nitrogen. Some do. <clears throat> Anita says, used fetid swamp water on corn. It grew two feet in a week. Yeah, it's awesome. Hey, I'm sorry in Indonesia. Thank you very much. I was talking about Indonesia earlier. Um, I love your people. I love the islands there. 
I had a fantastic trip there um, doing an agricultural tour and meeting some farmers, and I learned a lot. So thank you. Glad you're here. So if you were to thin it out really far, you could just water past it all the time because you're, you're just, you just got nutrients flowing into the root zone. It's, uh, it's, it's great. It works really well. But if it's too strong, it's too much. You may overstimulate, and you don't want that. You don't want to throw everything out of whack. If you want to make compost faster, you can always use fetid swamp water and just dump it on piles of wood chips or straw or whatever you're trying to break down. Northern Tide Garden Guy says you could charge biochar with it. Absolutely. Hey, Pastor Don, good to see you, man. Welcome back. Luke says, could you do a video on how to make your own grits? Well, I, I could tell you how to do it. I don't make them I don't make them the proper way. I just uh I just put the co the corn through a grinder and then pour water over it and then slow cook them until they're soft enough to eat. You're supposed to nixtamalize, which frees up more of the minerals in it. You're supposed to actually soak them in lime and take the little outer parts off and then, you know, do, do all that stuff properly. <clears throat> so, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to feed your plants and your gardens. And, and I like to keep things as simple as possible. That one question that I got that that my wife answered in that last video we did, uh, where she answered all the uh, asked all the questions about swamp water, interrogated me about swamp water. You know why wouldn't you just use compost? Well, the answer is uh, it's hard to make enough compost for a large garden, and this just brewing stuff in buckets and using it as a liquid fertilizer and and basically irrigating and fertilizing at the same time, just pouring it down the road pour it down all those rows you could stretch a small amount of fertility over a great big space with slow delivery of nutrients and it's quick it's quick like miracle grow almost you know it's in that zone where it's like wow that stuff's really started to green up you know it's pretty funny it's very interesting northern tide garden guy says tito sand will help build your sandy soil over time is that the um, is that made from the crushed shells of crabs, etc.? Yeah, thank you, Chris. <laughs> Chris said that was a very entertaining video. I was laughing the whole time. My wife is hilarious. She is so funny. Bleak Creek says, "Hey, David, can you do the grocery row system on a hill?" Yes, but I would make a change. I would do it if you look up natural vegetative strips. Natural vegetative strips. It sounds like a vegan snack. NVP. <clears throat> you might find that interesting. If I was going to run grocery row gardens on the side of a hill, I would run them on contour. I would track the contour, and I would do them with my pathways Um you know, on the sides of the hill. I, w I would not run them up and down the hill. I would run them along the edge of the hill. So you got your hill like this, and it's flowing down, and you're running them like this. So curve them however you need to. And, uh, you know, it's it's going to be a little weird to walk around in there. You may want to make some diagonal paths through the system. You may want to space a little wider. And I would definitely concentrate on getting good, strong tree systems in there first so you're not losing anything to erosion as much as possible. But uh, after a certain slope, you should really just concentrate on trees for the most part. But if you have trees, you can plant around the roots of the trees. It's mostly a perennial system. It could be a completely perennial system. So definitely do that. Got a question here about composting. We let's see composting roadkill. Where is this here? I I where did that roadkill one go? <clears throat> I'm trying to find it. I saw it and I said I'm going to talk about this. Oh here we go, David. David, I should have remembered it was a David. What do you think about composting fresh roadkill? Serious question. Oh, I've done it before. I don't like to pick up roadkill because it's kind of gross. 
I, I mean, I did that sort of thing when I was younger. Like, I'll just throw it in my backyard and compost it. But I don't really do it that often anymore. Um, you know, and we also get a lot. I mean, we have so many kids in our house that there's a lot of food processing going on. So my wife will be making chicken stock and cooking cooking entire chickens and cooking a lot of meat and so there's we have a lot that is flowing out the door in spent bones and skin and that kind of stuff that I usually just bury. And then we you know, we raise our own chickens. Sometimes I'll throw rotten eggs down in the holes. Um but I, there's nothing wrong with composting fresh roadkill. I would just bury it deeply and plant over the top of it or throw it right into the middle of a compost pile that animals can't dig into. I have had trouble here with uh, animals coming into the yard and digging up my pumpkin hills. I remember that video where I put all the chicken guts in the ground. Everything was going really great for a little while, and then something sniffed out some of it and dug up some of them and tore some of my uh, pumpkin vines out, which was kind of irritating. But I thought, man, we dug deep, and it's, they still got it. But it it may be that it was a you know sandy soil, plus we're in a very high predator load area. We've got coyotes, and they some of the neighbors swear there's a panther, and the neighbor's dogs wander around the yard and that kind of stuff. So you know what happens. I would, I would bury it deep or stick it in the middle of a compost pile that you can't... Um, you know, an animal can't get into it and tear it up. It'll rot really fast in the middle of a hot compost pile, though. Thank you. I'm sorry, says, glad to have you, David. Looking forward to welcoming you back to Bali. Bali was beautiful. A lot. Very high level of craftsmanship. I noticed that Bali seemed to have the best, some of the best craftsmanship I saw. <clears throat> Incredible. Orlando says, just leave weeds and water and use as fertilizer. Yep, that's right. But I also throw other stuff in there sometimes too, like Epsom salts or a little bit of uh, chicken manure or goat manure or um, even I'll, I'll throw some bones in there or rotten eggs or whatever sometimes. Hey! Hello, bears. Hello, Waterloo Bear. Thank you very much. You still love me? Love you too. I'm trying to be very loving. My mom is very loving. And my sisters are very loving. My brother is slightly loving. And uh, and so, you know, I pray that the Lord will help me to love people. Instead of, but generally the first thing I do when somebody's got a problem is just try to figure out how to fix the problem. And sometimes really what somebody needs is for you to just listen and to give them a hug or to um, just, you know, I don't know, just be there. And I always, I'm like, oh, you know what you could do? I got an idea. I go into professor mode. And that's not always helpful. My, my, <laughs> my mom and my sisters are so much better at uh, just being there when somebody's like, like, they just know when somebody's upset and they just show up and help and bring people food and that kind of stuff. And I don't even think about it. I'm like, hmm, that is an interesting problem. Have you considered consolidating that debt into one? Now, you got to be careful when you consolidate debt because blah, 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 and I'll start thinking, trying to figure out, I'm going to fix your problem. You know what? Or or I just, I'm like, well, that's kind of dumb that you did that. Why did you do that? You know, that's not good. Got to love people. And I'm working on it. Always working on it. Especially, it's especially hard to love people that have directly hurt you or turned on you. I'm not good at that. And that's why I think, yeah, I asked our pastor once, I said, I don't understand how you love people when they are just, like, how do you have compassion on people that are just really stupid and awful? And he says, well, the compassion doesn't really come from me. <laughs> I have to, I have to ask for it. It's like, oh, huh, that's good. That's better. I need to work on that. I need to work on that. All right, let's see. Here we go. I'm going to see where we are. <clears throat> Can you grow a rambutan in Central Florida? Kim asks, no. Not unless you grow it in a pot or in a greenhouse. Rambutan really, really likes the heat. Um, Andrew says, I put DFSW in a miracle Growth sprayer. I'm not going to say your name, Andrew. You've got to change that name. That is not the way to do it. That is not the way to win friend and influence people. 
Um, I put DFSW in a Miracle Grow sprayer and apply it to the garden that way. It dilutes as I spray. That's a very good idea. I've thought about doing that. I need to. I need to actually get a better straining system. It's on my list of things to do. When I get to my next homestead, I want to come up with a better system for straining and distributing this fetid swamp water because I really think that I have barely touched the surface of what you could do with this stuff. <clears throat> Homemade bone meal is a good idea. It's just um, a matter of you got to put the bones out somewhere to dry where the animals aren't going to get it or whatever and then smash it up. You know, you could probably, um, if you knew somebody with a hammer mill, that would really be the way to do it. So. What is my birthday? Um, are you a fed, John? <laughs> hey, good evening, Matthew. It's like polyculture meets permaculture. That's right. Uh, Patriot1776 says, Dave's fetid swamp water works great for my tomatoes here in Kentucky. I'm very glad to hear it. I'm always happy when people have success. <laughs> I don't want to mess everybody up. I don't want you all to kill your gardens. But you probably won't. Luke says, I found a pawpaw with fruit on the tree and across the road. Well, praise the Lord. That's awesome. I've always looked for pawpaws in the wild, and I I only seem to ever find the little uh, pygmaea types or some of the like the small fruited ones in Florida. I would love to find some Asamina triloba. So cool. Ah, let's see. I'm trying to get here. Dan says, I dump roadkill into my compost piles, but they are enclosed in a woven wire mesh so critters can't dig in. That's smart. That is smart. If you guys are interested in composting, I'm going to pitch my book right here. I'm putting a link to Amazon, but I'll also put a link to Not Jeff Bezos. This is the Not Jeff Bezos way to buy my books. If you're interested in compost everything, I wrote... Here, here's a book. This is where I explain Dave's fetid swamp water. Uh, and a bunch of other simple composting stuff. Compost everything. You can look it up on Amazon. It's a very popular little book. Got a bunch of... It's like just takes all the annoying stuff about composting and simplifies it down into something usable because I, ain't nobody got time for all that crazy... Yeah, I'm going to go buy a tumbler and I'm going to mix it exactly right and I'm going to do this and every three days I'm going to do this and every two days I'm going to do this and it's like... <sighs> there's got to be better ways than that because... I mean, who really has a gigantic stack of kitchen scraps that's exactly the right ratio to a big stack of dry carbon materials all at once so you can make a cubic yard of compost and get it up to 145 degrees with your composting thermometer and, and turn it every three days? Some people love making it. Like, some people like baking bread from scratch and grinding their own grain and everything. It's great. I love those people. But I kind of I, I wanted to get stuff into my garden as fast as possible and just use the fertility that I felt like was running past us every day. So uh, I experimented for years, and then I wrote Compost Everything, The Good Guide to Extreme Composting, which is pretty much like the minimalist guide to composting. How do you break this down into processes that make sense in the average backyard for the average person on, like, zero budget? That's what I'm into. And um, it kind of it came to be, the book Compost Everything came to be because I got a load of manure from a dairy that had persistent herbicides in it and killed tons of my plants. So... I took all the experiments that I had done and everything that I've been playing with, and I that was the year I think that I discovered Dave's fetid swamp water through experimenting with making manure teas and comfort teas and other things. And I thought, what would happen if I just started to mix all the high fertility stuff I could find into a barrel, just cover it with water, let it rot? And I mean, previous to that, I had done compost tea with bubblers and been really careful about it and all that stuff and I was like oh let's just see and so I called it Dave's fetid swamp water as a joke and then I found out later that uh, the Koreans had been doing very similar things for hundreds if not thousands of years so that feels kind of good I like independently rediscovered something useful it just seemed like why could you do it with manure slurries and I couldn't do it in my backyard <clears throat> why is it wrong and will it actually kill the plants? Will the anaerobic stuff kill my plants? No. Didn't. So, I wrote compost everything. 
so you can all get in all, all kinds of trouble. Actually, it's basically so you could feed your garden in a crisis. That's... I, I felt like there was going to be an economic crash coming, and I felt like things might get tough, and that we were living in kind of a, a dream world about how easy, you know, and how easy it was to buy food and to grow food and to get whatever we needed for our garden. So that was a big influence on writing Compost Everything, too, because I, I wanted to make sure that I could actually feed through a crash, and I did not want to deal with any kind of complicated infrastructure. I wanted to be able to use stuff and use stuff right away. <clears throat> Speak Life says, I, I had an area that would dry out really quickly. I buried old clothes to dry rotten for rags, lined it behind plants under about four inches of soil. It worked like a sponge and is now decomposed fully. That's a great idea. You, you basically just made a little water reservoir in the soil. And if you're using natural fibers, that's great. Hopsari says, my pumpkin grows on top of the weeds. Should I bury the stem to the ground? You know, Hopsari... Um, it does help if you can just take a shovel full of dirt and put it over some of the joints on the pumpkin. I don't know if you have vine borers over there in Indonesia or other things that destroy the vines, but I like to pour a little bit of dirt, pile a little dirt, and, and hold the pumpkins down to the ground if they start growing over the top of stuff or climbing. I like to direct them back to the ground so they grow more roots at all the joints in the vine. So if you can, I would do it unless you don't have things that are going to split the vines up and destroy them. Pastor Don says everyone across the Gulf Coast swear they know someone who has seen a panther. It's like Bigfoot. That's right. <clears throat> Enjoy Being says, would a contoured grocery row hillside garden be a benefit incorporating swale principles regarding trees being planted on the downhill side of the row? Yeah. I think so. I think there's a lot of interesting experiments that you could do with that. And that's why I would look up the natural vegetative strips and look up permaculture swales and all that stuff. I have not done... I, I only gardened on hills for four years and did not get to do anything great and permanent there, which is a frustration to me because there was a lot of stuff I wanted to do experiment-wise that I couldn't do because I didn't get land. And then I got land... I was building a house, and then the pandemic came, and I ended up losing all my homestead, and, you know, these things happen. So, let me live vicariously through your experiments of growing on slopes. I find it fascinating. Really fascinating. The idea that you could trap all the water coming down and hold it, and hold the hillside, stop erosion, maybe even grow crops in between, maybe even create um, more more compost over time and maybe even have it start to turn into a natural terrace system <clears throat> yeah you want to pro you want to you want to fix problems that's right francesca says how are the best use of eggshells in the garden i usually just smash eggshells up and scatter them around the garden or just crush them into my compost pile and or just throw entire eggs into my compost pile. If I got ugly eggs, I pop them. I just smash them on top of the ground because we get some pretty nasty looking eggs sometimes, like where the chickens lay directly in the muck because somebody else kicked them out of a nest box or something like that. Or I find eggs that have been buried. I put them on top of the compost pile and just smash them and let them rot down in. And then over time, lots of li lots of tiny bits of eggshell get scattered through all my gardens. You can dig in my gardens and see little bits of eggshell here and there, which is fine. There's uh, Some people will take the eggshells and dry them or even toast them in a toaster. The guy that wrote the Regenerative Amendments book does this. I can't remember his name at the moment. Ugh. Um, cannot remember his name. I'm sorry. But he, uh, he puts them in apple cider vinegar, crushes, crushes a bunch of toasted eggshells. He toasts them to burn most of the organic stuff off of them. And then crushes the eggshells down into a jar and covers it with apple cider vinegar and leaves the jar cracked open or puts a cloth over it because it starts fizzing. The vinegar starts pulling the calcium out of it and they, the alkaline and the acid start reacting with each other. And then after a few weeks, he takes a little bit of that solution and puts it into a watering can. We're talking like a tablespoon or two into a watering can and then waters his tomatoes with them. And he says that that helps. I don't know. 
I haven't tried it yet. I have uh, I have a jar on the counter <clears throat> that I'm doing it in, but I haven't tried. I haven't tried to do experiments side by side. Carolyn, you are a great encourager. Thank you. <laughs> Jeanette says, I learned to tell other adults that they know best. Sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not, but some, it does make people feel better if you tell them that. You probably know best. I'm trying to decide. Um, I'm trying to decide if I should pay alimony or just kill her. And I looked at the, the laws, and it doesn't look like it's really that long I'd be in jail compared to the commitment that I have otherwise. No, I'm just really struggling with this right now. You know what? You know best. I just want you to know you know best. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. You know best. You probably know best. <laughs> I want to know what love is. <laughs> Pretty funny. <laughs> Talking about, you know, here's another thing. This is interesting. The fastest growth I ever saw on a tree related to swamp water and other delights and composting secrets. The fastest growth I ever saw in a tree was when I put a kiddie pool at the bottom of a mulberry tree and I put water in it and the ducks would go play in it every day and they would leave manure all over the place and they would fill their mouths full of feed and then swish it around in the water and they'd muck the water up and it would turn into like disgusting algae manure water in just a few days. And they were constantly splashing it on this tree. And I kept pouring it out and cleaning it up so it didn't look so disgusting and it wouldn't breed mosquitoes. And that silly mulberry tree, I never saw growth like this before. It was unbelievable. Like, it was a little tree about that big around. And within a year, it was this big around. It was turning into a shade tree. In a couple of years, it shaded the entire chicken run area. I could not believe it. But that completely convinced me of the fertigation. It was water with a bit of manure in it. Probably a little, you know, a little bit of feed. And a lot of biological activity. And just always trickling past that root zone. Every day they were splashing the roots of that mulberry with that manure water and playing in it and preening themselves and splashing, making a horrible, gross mess. There was always this slop of muddy area around it. And it was at one edge of that tree. That tree just went nuts. So the fertigation thing absolutely works. And if you have ducks, I, I highly recommend getting your trees to grow by just going and filling a kiddie pool and leaving it at the bottom of a tree. They'll go and play in it. <clears throat> it's nuts. Christopher, thank you very much. Christopher sends a super chat. That's our first super chat of the evening, isn't it? Wow. Sorry. We'll work for tips. I'm not, uh, I'm trying to decide if I should, uh, beg for money or, uh, or go to prison. Uh, no, uh, he says my, <laughs> my, my contribution this week to you getting land of your own. Thank you very much. That's something that's on our hearts and something we'd really like to do. How far away is your target? Months, years, hundreds of thousands or hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years or pretty soon, pretty soon. I am working on it and hoping and praying and trying to sort things out. And uh, man, I hope so soon. I hope so soon. This is not a really good time to move because it's the summer and trying to transplant things and everything is complicated and a lot of stuff will die. But I am so ready to be in a place of our own and I'm working on it. And I, I, I we have we have a good option and it looks like we'll get it. But, um, you know, it's not over. It's not finished until it's finished. And then if we do get it, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done to make it to make it a good gardening space i have some ideas <clears throat> but out where it is there are a lot a lot a lot of deer and that's going to be a big problem so 
you know, it would be really great to um, be able to fall garden on our own property. So pray about it. You know, I don't want to do anything that I don't want to do anything that I'm not supposed to do or force anything. But it really feels like we're kind of getting funneled into something. And it's more expensive than I would like to spend. And um, at the same time, it's got probably everything we need. And more, way more. You know, it's it's just, I, I'm always kind of reticent. And, and usually what I do when I have a big thing like this is I charge forwards and say, I'm going to see if I can make it happen. And I'll, and I'll pray. And I'll pray with my wife and kids. And I'll say, all right. We are going to pray, and if this is not supposed to happen, Father, please make it obvious. Please knock, just make it super obvious. <clears throat> we almost bought a piece of property earlier in the year until I was warned that some people that I would be dealing with in the area would gladly cut our throats because we were outsiders. Whoa! Okay, thank you. Appreciate the warning. Um... And it gets worse than that. I can't even tell you just because I'm afraid of those people. Um, but, you know, some, sometimes these things happen and, and you don't know sometimes what you're getting into until afterwards, except I believe that God knows everything um, and that he can arrange things. And if you legitimately believe that God is your father and is watching out for you like you would watch out for your own kids, if you ask your dad, Dad, do you think this is a good idea? And your dad knows that it's not a good idea. Your dad is going to tell you. So that's what we do. I always say, okay, Lord, make it obvious that we're supposed to get it or not supposed to get it in any way you want to do it. And sometimes it'll be somebody calling us and saying, oh, no, you shouldn't do this. Or it might be somebody saying, hey, I just really think that this is what you're supposed to do. And this opportunity is unbelievable and go for it. Sometimes this financing doesn't happen. Sometimes it's just some random person calls you out of the blue and says, hey, there's this opportunity. And you were praying for an opportunity that morning. So you don't really know, but um, it doesn't mean that you're not going to end up in the wrong place or something like that because the Lord is actually more concerned about your character than he is about you being happy. So if something will make you into a better servant, a better tool, a better child, um, he will let that happen to you. And it may be painful or unpleasant or whatever else, but you get to the other side of it and you're like, now I know what it feels like. Now I know that when I did such and such a thing that I really hurt that person because now I've gone through it. You know, you pick these things up, but sometimes it's really unpleasant. Um, so, you know, you always just go, okay, Lord, uh, let's see what happens. So that's my long answer to yes, I hope so. Um, Lord willing, I will make an announcement if it actually works. And uh, there you go. And thank you very much for the contribution. <laughs> I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Carolyn says, tip for allowing the great teaching, and hopefully you'll have your own place soon. Thank you very much. I would love to have a place that's long enough term so I could really, really do tree training and plant breeding and stuff. I keep getting places or renting places and then only having it for a year or two and then starting over again. And it's very difficult. It's difficult to keep starting over again when you really want to do some experimenting. So. Can you compost moonshine peaches? Yeah, totally. Do it. Um, let's see where I am here. Love is Hope says, I've been saving like crazy. I want to pay cra cash. I, I agree. That's the best way to do it. <laughs> Pastor Don says, David, just follow your heart. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Kim. Take America back says, I want 10 acres, Tennessee or Missouri, low taxes, few homestead laws, lots of land. Good idea. I think uh, Doug and Stacy are in uh, Missouri. They seem to like it. I need a bigger freezer for all the deer. I love it. Northern Thai Garden guy says, deer is yummy and the leftovers make good swamp water. That's so true. You got to grow way more food than the deer can ever eat. Uh, apparently there's like 20 
deer that regularly go through this property, so. Enjoy Being says people can grow 1,200 pounds of food a year on a 35 square foot garden space. Five acres would be good, maybe 10. I'm on 22 and it would be too much. Yeah. You know, one of, the, one of my problems, this is gardening confessions from David the Good. One of my problems is I always want to make a really big garden. <clears throat> I want to till up a huge area if I have a tiller or put in a long, long row. I like really long rows. But sometimes my soil is not as good as my ambition. And, you know, you can do better often by really highly improving a small area compared to tilling up a great big area and getting half-hearted, lackluster, poor, poor crops. We have found that the soil where we are right now is so bad that even with fertilizer and some lime or alfalfa pellets or some manure or whatever else, it still grows bad harvests. It's horrible dirt. It's like cursed grit. And it has been the worst struggle and some of the worst harvests. I feel like it's like... Um, just it just sucks all the fertility away and it's a fight and the grocery row gardens have done the very best they're the most resilient out of all the gardens that i've planted my little mounded beds didn't do very well my row gardens did pretty well in the cool time of year but as soon as the weather starts to warm up it gets rough and i have to really feed the soil to get harvest out of them and i you know i met people that were not that far away and they were just doing simple row gardens with like 10 10 10 and they brought in so much food that they were stocking the food bank and bringing bags and bags of food to church. I'm like, these are just a, re just a retired couple using chemical fertilizer. The soil makes all the difference in the world. You're not fighting geology right from the beginning. Whew. Big difference. And what I really should have done probably here would be to start with a garden that was really itty bitty and then absolutely pack it with biochar and stuff. But I, I just I don't think I don't think I even understood how incredibly bad the soil was until, you know, having been here almost two years. <clears throat> Barbara says, in some situations, I don't think God cares. It sounds insensitive, I know. Does it matter whether we eat a baked potato or soup for dinner? Do we need to pray over everything like that? No, absolutely not. Basically, you just want to pray. I, I, I just think, I, I find that it's important for me to not get stuck in stupid things because I didn't ask. I, I mean, I don't pray, oh, Lord, do you want me to buy... A Honda Civic or a Cutlass Supreme? Obviously, he wants me to buy the Cutlass Supreme. But, no, I mean, what you eat for dinner? I mean, I don't, whatever, <laughs> whatever. No, I, I just generally would pray, you know, is this going to, is this going to be a bad idea? Because I don't know every person involved. I don't know the area. I don't have enough wisdom. I need... You know, in the past, people would use divination to try and figure out, do I go to battle today or not? Let's slaughter an elk and then read its guts. But we Christians don't do that. You know, we, we don't do divination. We ask the Lord to guide us. And it's less messy. <clears throat> but you're right. I don't think God cares that much. Barbara, I don't think I don't care. I don't think God cares if you decide to paint one afternoon, or if you decided you wanted to sew, or if you decided you wanted to go work on your garden. Really, you know. <laughs> Christopher says, "What is your secret to growing turnips?" I usually space them pretty widely. I I plant them when it's cool out. I give them a decent amount of compost and I water them, and they grow. But it doesn't mean that that. It doesn't mean that pastures are, or that your turnips are going to be happy in like every situation. We just um, we do pretty well with them so long as we have moderate fertility, and it's got to be the cool time of year. They do not like it when it gets warm. 
And Beverly says, waiting for my grocery or gardening book to arrive. Awesome. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it. I really like the idea and I've had fun with it. Uh, John says, God has fed me well and sends a super chat. Thank you very much. I'm glad to hear it. He takes care of us. I could have my own science lab. That's a good idea. <clears throat> Jen says, uh, keeping deer out of the orchard with fishing line. I've heard about some of that. Got lots of mounts to feed. Deer is a great addition to that, Chris says. Yeah, I agree. Hey, thank you. Off grid with Doug and Stacy. Good to see you, man. I didn't even see you in the chat. <laughs> You guys are encouraging. Let's see where I am here. Florida girl says, "Oh yay, David! I was thinking of you today as I chopped and dropped and made a new black-eyed pea swamp water. Oh, that's a great idea. You gotta have good nitrogen in there." <laughs> James says, I now know what dirt poor means. You know, when I was when I first came to Alabama and I was helping a ministry look around at some soil and they looked at these different spots. And one place we looked at, I'll tell you, that was the worst dirt. That was as bad as the dirt here almost. It was terrible dirt. It was this it was this nasty clay and sand and it was red and and uh there were ruts in the ground from erosion. There were a lot of just nasty-looking, scrubby, sick oaks and pines. And it was not good soil at all. Not good. Obviously acid. Obviously infertile. And we were going back through the woods there. And there was, you know, it was like a kind of an abandoned property with some junk laying around. It was a nice big piece of property, and it was cheap. But I told him, I said, you know, this piece of property is big, but this is trash soil. This is just, I would not want to try and eke out food from this location. And the real estate agent said, yeah, he says, these were, these people were, you know, it would have been a hard scrabble existence. This is like just hard dirt farming here. He goes, I don't think they could grow much. He said, I bet you it was a lot more deer and just eating deer, you know, and chickens and eggs. And she says, it's it's hard to grow anything out here. <clears throat> we found a couple of old gravestones back in the woods that had gotten pushed around by trees. And I thought these people are buried in this dirt that probably barely supported them when they were alive, and now they're forgotten. It's just, it's just rough. Yeah, I had a horrible potato harvest, too. Thank you, C6903, for the super chat. Much appreciated. Come Holy Ghost. Thank you, Northern Tide Garden Guy. <laughs> Christopher said you've inspired me to find gardening and God, and I thank you for that. You're very welcome. God is a gardener, too, so... One of the first things God did was plant a garden. Boyd says, what can you plant in this crazy 90 plus degree heat, David? Uh, you can plant black eyed peas and okra and probably you could get away with another round of sweet potatoes, but I, I probably wouldn't. Nothing really looks that great. It's just so hot, but in a couple of months it'll chill out. Trying to find this here. <clears throat> Austin says, Edible Acres on YouTube has a lot of good advice on deer. I think I am subscribed to Edible Acres. I will look that up. Thank you. If I remember, I will try to remember. Question about keeping rats out of the garden, Sarah asks. Sarah 2.0. I Sarah 1.0? Never mind. Get a, I don't know, you upgrade her. Uh, my sister won't let me plant in her yard because she has rats. You, you can't keep rats out of the garden in the city. They just show up. You know, I mean, I remember going out in Fort Lauderdale at night and watching rats run down the power lines. They just run through, run down the power lines into the trees like squirrels. 
it's the problem in the city, but um, you're going to have to probably get your own yard, I guess, or borrow somebody else's yard. There's so much wonderful stuff you can grow in Port St. Lucie. It's such a great, mild climate. Oh, I hate to see you not able to garden because you're afraid of rats. I mean, the rats are going to be there whether or not, but I know people don't like anything. They don't like any brush or anything near the house because the rats might get on it. The rats are part of nature. And they're nice rats. Those are, you could bet if they were eating your garden and hanging out and having good organic food, those are going to be the sweetest rats. Beverly says, my neighbors do not appreciate my swamp water, but my tomatoes and peas do. <clears throat> ah, swamp water smells like the horse farm up the road. I blend right in. That's nice. Northern Thai Garden Guy has cobras that take care of the rats. Sarah 2.0, you should get a cobra and tell your sister about it. Patricia says, Grocery Row Gardening is great info and a quick read. I received it and read it in an hour. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for reading it. Um, some people read faster than others, but it's not a very big book. It's just a little booklet. I... Um, People kept asking how I made the garden system and what my thinking was behind it and where did you get this idea and does it work and all this kind of stuff. And I said, why don't you just join me in this experiment? I will just write it down because people kept asking about it. All right, I'll write it down. I was going to wait like five years before I wrote it. So I just figured I'm going to just put this idea out right there now as a little booklet. Ten bucks. Join me. Go plant your own. Ruth says, how are you composting your cow manure? Lately, I've been leaving it in the field, but I took a bunch of loads back here previously and I just... Some of them I dug into garden beds fresh. Some of it I um, stacked up into my compost piles and mixed it with a whole bunch of leaves from the woods. Boyd says, when do you dump or recycle your swamp water? Does it matter? I don't think it really matters. If I get tired of looking at it, it gets too many mosquitoes in it, I just dump it out and uh, take the scraps out of the bottom of it and... So I might strain it and put it in something else if I had another thing to put it in. But it doesn't really matter because all, it's all free. I just keep throwing new stuff in. I'll start a new batch whenever I want to. <clears throat> Leo says, I got your audiobooks and enjoyed them a lot. Well, thank you very much. I haven't done audiobooks for the last couple of books that I've done. Uh, I, I get asked to do them, but I'll tell you, since the pandemic, the sales of audiobooks have plummeted so much, it doesn't even make sense for me to do them. I might make, you know, $25 in a month for what takes a lot of time and effort to make. It takes me, it'd probably take me a couple of weeks to put an audiobook together. And then it's just such a slow drip where you're like, I mean, I've had audiobooks that don't really pay any more than four or five bucks in a month. And it's like, well, that's nice to have the four or five bucks in a month, but we're talking like a few cups of coffee for a week or two's work. And oh, that's not good. Ruth says, how did fresh manure do in your garden? I buried it under like a foot or so of dirt and then planted on top of it and did just fine. Psilocybin is the name of the psychedelic mushrooms which grow on uh, cow pies. That's the name. That's what they... It's Psilocybin is the, the name. Jeanette. Hey, thank you, pizza guy. I appreciate it. Much love from Alaska. Hey, you guys might be part of Russia again soon, right? Are you excited? I uh, kind of like the minimalist flag, you know? I mean, still got the red, white, and blue. It's not a big deal. Yeah, Christopher says, you would think that during the pandemic that audiobooks would skyrocket. That surprises me. I think the reason that they crashed through the floor was because people stopped commuting. A lot of people still are at home. A lot of people are working from home now. So the people that were regularly listening to audiobooks while they were driving, I think, um, I think that's what happened. I think it just, uh, the daily drive went away. Nuts. <laughs> you guys trying to decide. I like the minimalist flag. I, I don't know. I, I don't understand the music. Uh, Seems like they drive their cars kind of crazy over there. I don't know. Northern Thai Garden Guy says, David, is there any, any issue for you having more of a bacterial dominance for your soil over fungal? 
I don't think so. I haven't really... I mean, it's just so esoteric to try and figure it out. I think that I do get some good fungal connections going on in the areas of the grocery row gardens that I mulch. But generally, I'm using um, the swamp water to spot feed specific things, which is probably turning them more bacterially dominated. But I'm not that worried. I figured it'll all sort itself out. Oh, thank you, Christopher. Christopher listened to Compost Everything in audiobook this last week. Well, I have got to run. Um, Green County Hiker Forestry says, Mary still listens to audiobooks and podcasts. If Turned Earth was an audiobook, she might listen to it. Hey, Love Cat. I, I didn't even see you here. How are you doing? I, I would love to do Turned Earth as an audiobook. That would be fun. This is my good books store. If you want to get any of my books off of Amazon and then because there's no other choice if you're an artist other than you know or if you're an author other than being on Amazon here's my Amazon link to compost everything if you're interested the good guide to extreme composting very popular great book China wishes they had this book um, SPQR Cincinnati I will answer this last question here on the super chat Ever tried to generate and concentrate NPK entirely from on-farm on sources? I'm working on a mini project to do just that. Other than attempting to balance via... See, I didn't do it in a laboratory sort of way. I said, okay, now I know that the wastes from the banana trees and the cocoa trees, cocoa leaves, back when I was uh, down in Grenada, there's a lot of potassium in there. So I would mix them into my compost piles. And I knew that there was a good amount of phosphorus in um, many deep tap-rooted plants. And I knew that that was in bone meal and in bones and in meat scraps and that sort of stuff. So I would throw some of that in. And then nitrogen I knew was also in the meat scraps. I knew that it was in urine. I knew that it was in uh, chicken manure. And so I tried to balance my NPKs along with having some micronutrients. But it was really in a slapdash throw it all in the compost pile and see what happens way. And some people say that you're, um, you know, you only need tiny amounts of really most of these minerals because your bacteria and fungi will make them available. So if you know that you have some from somewhere, it may become available as your plants need it because they signal that they need it and certain bacteria and fungi actually deliver it, which is kind of cool. But I, you know, that's it. it. If you're doing a more systematic approach, my hat is off to you, and if you find out, you know, a good way to do it, like you're concentrating and making granular fertilizers of your own or something like that, that would be really fun, really kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, share on it if you do it, and um, thank you very much for the the super chat. <clears throat> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing... Susie all like hamsters cause they sneak into her room at night Got a pen under her pillow so she can poke him in the eye, poke him in the eye Won't let them catch her sleeping, she'll be alert when the hamsters are creeping Poke him in the eye, 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 in the eye. Johnny loves a hamster named Brian, gives him all his hugs and kisses and now the hamster hate us and the friends to sink and swim with the fishes The well, snakes all smile and the lizards laugh Brian the hamster's Johnny's little golden calf So sing a song of pick the fence, sing a song of pie All my little homeboys poke them in the eye Spin around the wheel, press your face up to the glass Smile with your eyeballs It has a pretty hamster's past The carving knife But they got short tails His eyes <laughs> Sorry, crack me up um, Poking eyes is a way of life At least we are not snails Well, Vic was slick as 
on a kicky lick mick it's some shtick over who flicked his dick but he got nick by this quick dick who always tricks ticks and a quick bend a pick up sticks well they try to throw pies at the multicolored flyers wearing the itty bitty suits and tires but the flies are quick and they know the trick and they poke them in the eye yeah yeah then around the wheel press your face up to the glass Smile with your eyeballs that has a pretty hamster's past. I don't see a carving knife, but they got short tails. Poking eyes is a way of life, at least we are not snails. Poke him in the eye, 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 yeah, yeah. Poke him in the eye, 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 you know I take him swimming in my hamster swimming pool So grab your sneakers, teach your hamster how to fly And if it gets rowdy, just poke him In the eye, 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 poke him in the eye Poke him in the eye, poke him in the eye, poke him in the eye, yeah, yeah, yeah Poke him in the eye, poke him in the eye, poke him in the eye, poke him in I wrote that song a long time ago for my little sisters, actually. Pokemini <laughs> You have a wonderful evening, everybody. Enjoy being says, poke him in the eye was the last thing my granddad said to me before passing. That's what made me laugh in the middle of the song. I was like, how can that even be? But <laughs> I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't know if I should be sad or cracking up. I am so conflicted. I have learned the meaning of ambivalence. Oh my goodness. Big Brother says, are you a fan of the band Presidents of the United States of America? No, I like a couple of their songs. I'm not. I really haven't followed them at all other than, you know, peaches in a can. So, you all have a wonderful evening. Um, thank you all. God bless you and keep you. And make his face to shine upon you. And until next time, may your thumbs always be green. <laughs>